40,000 years ago, an age of ice destroyed much of what we had built. And with it began the time of the barbarians. Surprisingly, they evolved. If you ask me, some of them did not evolve. <laughs> Sometime around 2010 or 11, I started watching this show called The Sons of Anarchy. For those not familiar, it was basically a show about a biker gang, although to term it as just that would be a huge disservice to the quite excellent show that ran for seven seasons and ended in 2014. Admittedly, it's the promise of gang warfare and violence on wheels that initially gets your attention, but ultimately it's the themes of love, honor, loyalty, and brotherhood that are explored in the very nuanced lifestyle of a biker gang that keeps you hooked. Anyway, the reason why I brought up Sons of Anarchy, aside from a strong watch recommendation from me, is that this story is also about a biker gang. And just like the Sons of Anarchy, these guys are every bit as violent. But they differ in the fact that there is no sense of honor, loyalty, or brotherhood with this bunch. There is love though, but not for each other. Instead, a love for some grape soda and chocolate donuts. So let's talk about some dreadnought, shall we? When you are the arch enemy of America's daring, highly trained special mission force, you have got to employ some of the biggest, baddest, and in some cases, craziest individuals and characters into your ranks in order to have a fighting chance. Now, if I were in charge of Cobra's recruitment agency, I'm pretty sure that a biker gang wouldn't be anywhere near the top of the list of ideal recruits. The Dreadnoughts were basically a biker gang whose membership consisted of some of the meanest and most violent individuals on the planet. They were led by the master of disguise, Zartan, along with his siblings, Xandar and Zarana. Anyway, the Dreadnoughts were first formed in Australia, but eventually settled in their permanent base of operations, hidden somewhere in the Florida Everglades. And while they were often associated with Cobra, they would no sooner break out from them and go off with anyone else who would pay them more for their services. While in the original Marvel comic run, I do recall the Dreadnoughts being portrayed as quite competent and dangerous adversaries. In the Sunbow cartoon, they are more often than not portrayed as bumbling idiots, whose most famous episode was when they formed the 80s heavy metal band Cold Slither that played hypnotic music that would brainwash their audience into following Cobra. They are also known for comically subsisting on a unique diet of the aforementioned chocolate donuts and grape soda. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So let's rewind back to 1985, where the concept of a dreadnought and the first three members of the group were introduced as part of the fourth wave of figures of the real American hero toy line. As a kid, even without context, you could tell with one look at their card art that Buzzer, Ripper, and Torch were a team. They were meant to go together, and as such, when I had the opportunity to get all three in one go at my local toy shop in the 80s called Nova Fontana, I took it and excitedly brought these three miscreants home. Unlike the majority of the new enemies introduced that year who were all different types of Cobra Troopers, these guys definitely stood out with their non-military, ripped up and mismatched attire and their unconventional choices for weaponry. All this was topped off with some of the ugliest looking head sculpts I had ever seen on an action figure at the time. What can I say? I was instantly sold. Buzzer is often portrayed as the smartest of the bunch, although that really isn't saying much. He also often acts as the leader of the original trio. Actually, even before seeing them in the cartoon or comics, I instantly pegged him as the leader and my personal favorite because, well, he was the least ugly in my eyes and, more importantly, he was blonde. A hair color that at the time I often associated with the leader of any fictional team. Based on his file card, he actually had quite an interesting backstory, which began in England, where he was an extreme left-wing sociology don who for years harbored an intellectual displeasure and extreme indignation for what he perceived as society's two-faced morality. He also had a deep fascination with biker gangs and as a result, traveled to Australia in order to do extensive research on them. He eventually ended up joining one and went off to satisfy his desire to literally take society apart with his weapon of choice, a diamond tooth chainsaw. His figure also inexplicably had a canister of gasoline strapped to his back, making him a walking firebomb, but at least it meant his chainsaw would never go hungry. Now, before I go any further, I just wanted to mention comic book writer Larry Hama, who is lovingly referred to by most Joe fans as the godfather of the modern, a real American hero iteration of G.I. Joe. 
for the simple fact that he wrote the entire 155 issue run of the original Marvel comics and the majority of the bios of the file cards that came with each action figure, bringing to life ageless iconic characters like Snake Eyes, Scarlet, and Storm Shadow, all the way up to Skidmark. Anyway, I bring this up because I find it amusing thinking about how, in an effort to flesh out the dreadnoughts through the years, he must have had a blast coming up with different ways to illustrate just how despicable each individual member was. But to his credit, he would often insert some unique or interesting detail to show that they weren't just a bunch of cliché one-dimensional thugs and bad guys. Case in point, Ripper, a nasty individual whose life of crime started at a really early age when he was expelled from nursery school for extorting candy from his classmates. Ripper is your stereotypical angry, violent, and antisocial individual who, interestingly enough, is secretly a shrewd businessman and independently wealthy. He specializes in various edged weapons and cutting tools, but his favorite would be his assault rifle equipped with an oversized bayonet. I specifically remember Ripper having the ugliest action figure as I found his head to be unusually large and kind of blocky. I don't know, as a kid that really bothered me. Plus, I couldn't quite figure out what his main accessory was supposed to be. I mean, yes, he had his favorite rifle with the oversized bayonet, but he also came with this huge tool that to my 9-year-old self looked like a jackhammer of some sort. It was only later on as an adult that I learned that this was actually what was called the Jaws of Life, a hydraulic rescue tool used to assist in extraction of victims involved in vehicular accidents or who are trapped in small spaces. So leave it to a dreadnought to take a rescue tool and turn it into a weapon of destruction. Finally, rounding up the original trio, we have Torch, whose file card basically describes him best as an illiterate, unrepentant thug with a penchant for violence matched only by the utter depths of his stupidity. As his name suggests, his weapon is an oxyacetylene torch, which he modified into a working flamethrower. And yet, despite his rather unflattering character description, he does have one crucial redeeming factor as he is extremely skilled at repairing motorcycles, the default choice of ride for the Dreadnoughts. Another thing worth mentioning is that Buzzer, Ripper, and Torch had quite peculiar real names, Dick Blinken, Harry Nod, and Tom Winken, respectively. Their first names are in reference to the phrase Tom, Dick, and Harry, which is used as a placeholder for an unspecified group of people. And their last names are an obvious reference to the popular children's poem, Winkin, Blinkin, and Nod. Like I said, Larry Hama must have had a blast fleshing out these guys' characters, connecting this trio of violent thugs to a children's poem. Anyway, these three dreadnoughts were then thrown in with the previous year's success story, The Master of Disguise, Zartan, and it was a perfect match, and more importantly, a hit with the fans. And so in the following years, more dreadnoughts were added to the gang. But before we go any further, I know, I know, I dread doing this every time. But a YouTuber's gotta do what a YouTuber's gotta do. So please don't knock on me for asking you to subscribe to my channel. It would be very much appreciated and will help me tell more stories. But if you already have subscribed, then thank you. I raise a can of grape soda to you. So where were we? Ah yes, more dreadnoughts. So the first two, Xandar and Zarana, if their names didn't give it away, were Zartan's younger siblings. And I've already touched on these two in a previous story, so let's move on to the third new knock. The explosive expert, Monkey Wrench. First name Bill, last name Winky, which is a slang term for our little boys. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's not what Hama had in mind when he came up with the name. So moving on. Monkey Wrench started his career at an early age when he built and sold explosives to terrorists before the age of the internet, mind you. By age 16, he had made himself a pariah in his own hometown. He loves blowing things up so much that he would add unconventional items such as a Roman candle or other fireworks to add more bang to his already explosive contraptions. Aside from the various grenades that he wears in his chest, he also uses a harpoon as his main weapon of choice. To be honest, even with a whole load of grenades strapped onto his chest, as a kid, I never made the connection to Monkey Wrench being an explosives expert. I was too focused on how his name didn't quite jive with Buzzer, Ripper, and Torch, and his weapon of choice, a cross between a trident and a rifle, although admittedly cool looking, didn't quite make much sense to me. I don't know, even as a kid, this guy just felt like a second-rate dreadnought. 
Another notable strike against Monkey Wrench is that while the original three Dreadnoughts got nice modern updates in the 25th anniversary line years later, Monkey Wrench got a rather uninspired one, basically a kit bash from previously released figures. They didn't even bother to give him at this point his iconic trident harpoon thingy or shades. I remember going through great lengths of finding an original vintage monkey wrench on eBay just for his weapon and ordering custom tiny shades for my guy. I get that in today's classified line, detachable shades are the norm, but years ago, that was quite a stretch on my part just for the sake of accuracy. Ironic how I put so much effort into monkey wrench despite him never being one of my favorite knocks. Fortunately, Monkey Wrench wasn't the only new Dreadnought introduced that year. The Dreadnoughts were such a hit at the time that Hasbro decided to give them their own dedicated four-wheel vehicle of destruction, the Thunder Machine. And with it, of course, came the designated Dreadnought driver, Thrasher. Now that's better. Back to the er names. As per his file card, Thrasher was the spoiled child of middle-class parents who never disciplined him out of fear that by doing so would stifle energies he might need later on in life. So basically, millennial parents. Just kidding. Just kidding. Anyway, he was never denied anything no matter how many times the items he asked for usually ended up causing some type of disaster or destruction. He eventually ended up ditching his parents after they were injured in a car accident that may or may not have been caused by some repair work he did on the car's brakes. It also continues on to say that even for a dreadnought, this guy is pretty, pretty, pretty low as he derives an actual physical pleasure from inflicting pain and misery on others. The wild thing about this though is that this is actually the softened up version of his bio. Hama's original draft described Thrasher as a kid that always had bad luck with pets and all his playmates were mysteriously accident prone. And after maybe crippling his parents in the aforementioned car accident, this wild child wandered into the swamps where he could do whatever he wanted to do to living things and inanimate objects alike. Oh, and for some reason his real name, Bruno Lacrosse, wasn't revealed until 2004, 18 years after his debut. Quite a fitting name given his weapon of choice was a spiked ball that was welded onto the end of what looked to be a lacrosse stick. Anyway, at this point, dreadnoughts were all the rage and so Hasbro made it a point to introduce a new one every year and each time doing their best to make every new addition more deplorable than the previous one. So in 1987, we got the dreadnought pirate Zanzibar, whose real name, Morgan Teach, is actually a reference to two real-life pirates, Henry Morgan and Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard. Anyway, Zanzibar spent his formative years living on a garbage barge, making a living pickpocketing on various docks. Later on, he moved on to river piracy, stock fraud, and smuggling, and eventually joined the dreadnoughts when even those began to bore him. At face value, his whole pirate theme is kinda hokey. Okay, extremely hokey. But I think that just adds up to his appeal. Not so much in the toys design, but in that Zanzibar completely buys into his stereotypical pirate character as he speaks with an excess bluster and definitely dresses up the part complete with large buckled boots, top-notch ponytail, and eye patch that the other dreadnoughts suspect like the rest of his getup is just for show. As what is expected from any dreadnought, Zanzibar is described as extremely selfish with a penchant for stealing and having poor personal hygiene. His disposition is so nasty that even the other dreadnoughts don't like him and Zartan basically keeps him around just to keep an eye on him. The Zanzibar toy was also unique in that it actually came with rooted hair for the ponytail, which more often than not came off looking like a carrot top. But to make up for that, the figure came packed in with its own personal mode of transportation, a sort of hydrofoil type boat called the Air Skiff. Also worth noting is that one of Zanzibar's original working names was Keel Hall, which was eventually used to name the G.I. Joe Admiral who came with the USS Flag aircraft carrier. From pirate to admiral, now that's one hell of an upgrade for that code name. Anyway, in 1988, came possibly one of the most popular members of the Dreadnoughts, the massive enforcer, Road Pig. Prior to his reveal, I remember reading an article wherein he was referred to as a new incoming Dreadnought that would go down as one of the worst, and I thought to myself, where have I heard that before? And I scoffed at the name Road Pig, which to me sounded kinda dumb. But when I finally saw the character, well, it all made sense. When he was born, Road Pig was declared by his doctor to be the ugliest baby he had ever seen. 
he was expelled from kindergarten for milk money extortion, and he was later dishonorably discharged from the Cub Scouts. Aside from excessively smelling bad, a seemingly recurring theme with these knocks, Road Pig is unique in that he suffers from a split personality disorder, which was reflected in his original working name of Theophilus Kalikak, a reference to the Dukes and the Kalikaks, two families cited as evidence in favor of eugenics or the controlled practice of selective breeding of humans to weed out unfavorable traits. And Theophilus was regarded to be the worst member of the Dukes family. But that's a major tangent I'd rather not get into now. More importantly though, the word Kalikak was a pseudonym created from the two Greek words kalos and kakos, meaning good and bad, which basically summed up the two sides of Road Pig's personality, as a well-spoken and intelligent Donald DeLuca, his final identity named after a former Hasbro director, and the violent and dangerous Road Pig, an individual so obnoxious that the rest of the Dreadnoughts would rather kick him out of the gang outright. He only remains a member because they just haven't figured out a way to get rid of him. Oh, and the flavor text on the bottom of his file card were just a bunch of Rodney Dangerfield jokes, which probably explains why he looks like a roided up version of the comedian, and why he gets no respect. His weapon of choice consists of a custom sledgehammer made of a cinder block attached to a metal pipe, as well as an itty bitty ditty mini crossbow on his wrist completes his ensemble. By this time though, I had actually slowed down on toys, so unfortunately, I never got his original figure. But I am excitedly looking forward to a heavily rumored release in the classified line. Hopefully, Hasbro won't disappoint. And then finally, in 1989, as if the Dreadnoughts weren't despicable enough, Hasbro went ahead and added an animal poacher to their ranks. But not just any poacher. A poacher so bad that he was literally run out of Africa by other poachers for cheating at cards, smelling bad, and for generally being an a-hole. Other than that though, Naga Hyde is your typical poacher who considers most animals as lower life forms suitable only for skinning, stuffing, or eating. He also believes in strictly living off the land and so he refuses to use any deodorants, preferring to bathe himself in animal fat and will not eat processed foods or wear synthetic fibers. But don't mistake this eccentric naturalism as a love for Mother Earth. Instead, he believes that such man-made products would warn his animal targets of his murderous presence. Now, while I never had the original figure, I found it quite amusing that the dreadnought poacher Naga Hyde would be the first knock to actually come with an animal sidekick, a warthog named Clyde, which was odd given his profession and the fact that years later, Naga Hyde's real name would be stated as Clyde Hyde. Fortunately, this little mix-up seems to have been cleared up with the upcoming classified version of Naga Hyde, who also comes with a warthog now named Pork Belly. And he also comes with a monkey named Yobo. Anyway, Naga Hyde would be the last major Dreadnought character introduced in the toy line for quite a while as the next year ended the whole Dreadnought a year streak. But since then, there have been quite a lot of newer members introduced and added over various iterations and media of G.I. Joe. And no, I will not cover all of them, but I will mention a few who have had at least toys released of them that gives them a little bit more cred in my book. The first is Burnout, who is the resident dreadnought mechanic. Now this guy could have been an engineer if he didn't drop out of school. He's a natural genius at mechanics and had an early fascination with motorcycles. It was his handcrafted custom motorcycle work that got Zartan's attention and got him recruited into the Dreadnoughts. Of course, it goes without saying that he also had the prerequisite nasty personality and destructive tendencies that made him fit right in with the group. Now whether this was some writer's attempt to sort of diversify the ranks of the Dreadnoughts given that Burnout was African American, or that his write-up was basically the same as the original Dreadnought Torch. I didn't care. I liked Burnout's design and was quite happy to see his addition to the 25th anniversary line as part of a special Dreadnoughts box set. Next is Heart Wrencher, one of the few females not related to Zartan included in the Dreadnoughts ranks. As per her name, her weapon of choice is an oversized wrench. While her specialty is that of a, surprise surprise, mechanic, given her more attractive appearance, a more cynical person would probably assume that she remained a member of the Dreadnoughts for other reasons. And I'll leave it at that. She was often depicted in her sporadic appearances as Zartan's girlfriend, and you would think that this would give her a heightened status within the group. But I don't think Zartan was much of a giving or loving partner. Anyway, she eventually ended up with fellow wrencher Monkey Wrench. 
I could be wrong, but to my knowledge, the only actual toy of Heart Wrencher was a hastily constructed kit bash packed in with an exclusive collector's club dreadnought-themed repaint of the Cobra Stinger Jeep, both of which now fetch a mighty high price on eBay. So, yeah, as heartbreaking as it is, I never got a Heart Wrencher for my collection. And finally, we have Zanya, a late addition, but definitely worth mentioning since she is the long-lost daughter of Sartan. She was introduced in the Devil Deuce run of G.I. Joe, which sought to continue the events of the Marvel comics. By that time, the Dreadnoughts had grown into a massive statewide organization with multiple chapters all over the U.S., and his daughter, Zanya, was handpicked by Zartan to be his heir apparent to inherit it all. To be able to do so, the writers made sure to make her every bit as capable and cunning as her dear old dad, as her background includes growing up in poverty with her abusive biological mom and her mom's equally abusive boyfriend. Very early on, she learns of her true father's existence through her mom and develops pyromaniacal tendencies, which ultimately leads to her burning her own house down, killing her mom and the boyfriend, all at the tender age of nine. And after years of going out on her own, she eventually finds Zartan and joins up with the Dreadnoughts. Even though Devil's Jew ultimately lost the G.I. Joe license and the company that took over IDW made their own continuation of the Marvel series, basically negating everything Devil's Jew had done, Zanya remained a popular enough character to earn her own official action figure as well. As a whole, I wouldn't go as far as to say that these guys made a real difference in the battle between G.I. Joe and Cobra, but they sure as hell were entertaining and some of the most memorable bad guys in the series. And speaking of memorable bad guys, can you believe that the Dreadnoughts actually don't take the prize as the craziest enemies that the Joes had to face? If you ask me, that distinct honor goes to these guys over here. And if you want more Joe stuff, you can check out my playlist over here. Either way, thanks for watching and hope you come back for more. <laughs>